Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to my guide to another Sildeen Subterrain, our first Criterion dungeon in Final Fantasy XIV. It has a minimum item level of 610 and a maximum of 635, sinking the player down if they're higher than that, just for future proofing the content. It has several threatening trash packs and three bosses for you to contend with in order to achieve victory. I'll be breaking all of those down, so use the timestamps in the description to skip around if need be. As a heads up, all of the strategies in this guide also apply to the Savage difficulty of Criterion, as the mechanics are almost completely identical. At the end of the video, I'll make notes of things that are different in that bumped up difficulty. First off, the rules for Criterion are quite a bit different from the variant equivalent. There is only one path and it always has the same monsters, bosses, and mechanics the whole way through. You must do this content with four players, a balanced light party. All of the variant actions are gone except for the new variant raise 2 with a single charge. This action is the only method of raising allies in a fight, as all other methods are disabled. You can get the charge back when you defeat certain sections of the dungeon or when you just release back to the start. Other than that, you just have to defeat the final boss before the dungeon timer reaches zero, else you'll just have to requeue and do the dungeon all over again. Oh, and the monsters aren't omnidirectional in here either. Just thought I'd mention that. With that, let's get into the fights. First, we have several trash monsters to fight. Focus on the Belladonna and the Calic first, as they will patrol back and forth. The Belladonna has a donut AoE called Atropine Spore, so stay close. It has a tank buster called Deracinator, and respect the damage with this with cooldowns. It also has Frond to Front, which just makes you look away. The Calic alternates between two different attacks. First is left or right sweep. This will hit in a 210 degree cone aimed in the direction of the attack name, so just get to the opposite flank. Creeping Ivy will do a conal AoE in front of it, so if it turns to you, be sure to sidestep. Once those two are dealt with, we have two trash packs to contend with before the boss door will open. The West Pack has two Saprias and an Udumbara. The Saprias do a large forward conal AoE called Bloody Caress to avoid. Try to keep them facing away from the party if you're the tank at all times. The Udumbara has three large AoEs that it can use. Honeyed Front does a large conal AoE in front of it, Honeyed Left does a 180 degree AoE to the back left of the mob, and Honeyed Right does a 180 degree AoE to the back right. Just dance around them while you kill them and don't get hit. The East Trash Pack has two Oddcons and a Dryad. They mostly just fire targeted AoEs at everyone, but the Dryad has a large point-blank AoE called Arboreal Storm. When you see this casting, just get way out of range. After you clear all eight of these mobs, the first boss, Silky, will appear. Before pulling, we only use a few simple markers for a single mechanic later in the fight. You can place down more for orientation if you want, but the fight has tons of possible locations for you to resolve mechanics, so we really only use these. Also, shortly into the fight, Silky will cover the outer edge of the arena with a giant bleed. It's not instantly lethal, but don't touch it, please. The main gimmick of the fight are the suds. Silky will enchant its orb and the brooms it summons with an element, and this element determines the type of AoE they all use. Fizzling suds is the lightning enchant and causes four conal AoEs to fire out intercardinal from their center point. Chilling suds is the ice enchant and does a cross AoE from the start point. And bracing suds is the wind enchant, and does a donut AoE from the center point. The donut is a bit smaller than Silky's hitbox, so ensure you're within both hitbox rings, not along the outer edge. Silky's tail element is detonated every time an attack with soap in the name is used, while the brooms only detonate when Silky uses the attack soaping spree. They also interact with the different soap attacks in different ways, which we'll cover in the guide. These mechanics are gonna be remixed in several ways, so ensure you understand dodging them all accurately. At the start, Silky will do fizzling suds on its own before immediately using soaps up to detonate the element. Just be in front behind or on the left and right flanks to avoid this. It's just showing you how it looks. Next, Silky will jump middle and knock everyone away with Dust Bluster. Just knock back resist this or aim towards the corners. After that, it will cast Fresh Puff, summoning three puff brooms around the arena, one north, one southwest, and one southeast. They all have elements on them, but don't pay that any mind yet. Right after, Silky will look north and use Bracing Suds, enchanting itself with the wind element. It then follows up with Squeaky Clean, a three-part AoE with Silky being mopped across the arena. The first two sweeps will just do conal AoEs in front of Silky, but the third will do a two-third room-sized AoE. 
just stand behind and dodge in the direction that Silky leans first. You see it kind of land and then sweep the first time? Just go to the same side that it leans to first. These sweeps will also change the enchantment on the two brooms that it hits to wind, leaving one remaining ice or lightning broom. Silky will then use Chilling Suds on itself to change its tail to the Ice Element. After that, it will target a non-tank with Slippery Soap, performing a line AoE that deals split damage to everyone hit. The damage and effects will end at the target's location, so anyone splitting the damage should be sure to stand in front of the targeted player. This attack will also take on different effects depending on the tail element. For Chilling Suds, Everyone hit will need to be moving when they take the damage, or else they will be frozen and killed by the subsequent attack. Jumping in place or making small movements works just fine, but don't make large movements. You might accidentally move out of the AoE, or if you're the targeted player, move it away from the other players. Silky will also slide to the primary target's location and detonate their tail element. In this case, it will be the cross AoE from the ice element. So once the slide is complete, Dodge to the intercardinal sides of Silky's hitbox to avoid this attack. Be wary of the slide. Silky Tokyo drifts even with the slightest of movements, so you can very easily move it more than you intend and make dodging afterwards way more difficult. Now we'll also need to use Slippery Soap and hit one of the two wind brooms. This will change it to the ice element, otherwise there's just no safe spots on the arena with two donut AoEs. Which wind broom you hit will depend on what the remaining third broom is. If the third broom is ice, we'll need to aim Slippery Soap at either the southwest or southeast broom, whichever is wind. If the remaining broom is lightning, we'll need to ice the north broom. This makes the one remaining wind broom your safe spot for the end of the mechanic. Just ensure the player marked with the attack stands just on the other side of the broom to hit it, but not too close to the wall, else Silky might drift a little bit even more and make dodging a problem again. After Slippery Soap, Silky will use a tank buster called Carpet Beater. This will cause it to jump to the tank and do massive damage, so use mitigation. The tank should try to get Silky as close to the remaining Wind Broom as possible with the jump, so just try to move near the end of the cast. It's also single target, so don't worry about standing on anyone. After this, Silky will use Soaping Spree to detonate all of the brooms, so stand in the remaining Wind Broom's AoE to avoid everything. After Soaping Spree number 1 is Total Wash, a room-wide AoE and bleed. Respect this with Party Mitt and Healing. Right after that, Silky will use either Chilling Suds or Bracing Suds before casting Fresh Puff to summon four more brooms. Two of these brooms will be Ice and two Lightning. They can also spawn in either the four Cardinal or four Intercardinal sides of the room. Each broom will tether to one player and after a few seconds will move a fixed distance in the direction the player was when the marker wore off. It'll also do an AoE at its impact point, so don't get hit by that. The broom also has a hitbox indicator, which will be used to determine how the AoEs are aimed after the next attack. So bad angles can make for really nasty patterns for the next part of this mechanic. Oh, and if two brooms overlap, they will tether together and explode, wiping the group. So don't let that happen. Your goal is to make safe spaces in the room depending on what element Silky's tail is. As once the brooms move, Silky will use Soaping Spree to detonate all of the brooms and itself at the same time. If it's Bracing Suds, the middle of the room needs to be made safe. If you're tethered to Ice Brooms, you'll do one of two movements. If the Ice Brooms are on the Cardinals, simply aim them towards the Intercardinals like you see me doing here. If the Ice Brooms are Intercardinal, just go towards the nearest wall. For the Lightning Brooms, if they are Cardinal, just aim them directly at the nearest wall. If they are intercardinal, aim them towards a cardinal. You can also aim the intercardinal lightning brooms directly into the nearest corner, as that will leave a giant open space in the middle. No matter what you do, as long as the center of the room is safe at the end of it, you should be alright. For intercardinal safe, aka chilling suds, just aim every broom directly away from the center of the room, regardless of the pattern. This creates one of two potential safe spots. If the lightning brooms are in the corners, stand between them and the center of the room. If the lightning brooms are on the cardinals, the safest spots are the two floor lines east or west of them, as you see in the video. There are actually melee range safe spots for this pattern as well, but they're quite small and safety definitely takes priority here. 
After soaping spree number two, Silky will buff its tail with one of the Sud attacks and use a standalone Slippery Soap. Depending on the element, you'll need to react accordingly. You already know about Chilling Sud, so if you see that, do it the same way. Fizzling Suds will follow the split damage AoE up with the intercardinal AoEs, but every player will also do a wide lightning AoE around them. You just need every player to spread in a different direction cardinally around Silky. We did tank behind Silky, healer in front, and each DPS took one of the flanks. If they clip each other, you'll do massive damage to the nearby player, paralyze, and inflict damage down, so remember your assigned spots. For Bracing Suds, the AoE will knock the primary player back and drag every other player along with them before doing the Donut AoE. The primary target player should try to stay within the hitbox here with everyone else squished in front of them. As with Silky in the center, it is quite easy for it to drag the target player into the wall. It also helps to aim this AoE towards a corner of the room for extra safety, but that's not mandatory. After another total wash, Silky will use Fresh Puff to summon 8 brooms along the middle of the room. They all have an element, but Silky will shortly after cleanse 6 of them with Eastern Ewer. This has 3 water AoEs wash through the middle of the room from north to south and cleanse any brooms they hit, leaving only 2 left with an element. Now you just need to react to what's left. If there's a wind broom, just stand on it. If there's an ice broom and a lightning broom, stand east or west of the lightning broom. And if it's double lightning brooms, stand north or south of either broom. Once soaping spree goes off, these brooms will explode and disappear, leaving six brooms without an element. We'll need to get rid of these brooms with the next mechanic, else they're going to cause problems later on. Silky will use chilling suds and then another carpet beater. The tank wants to make sure Silky's jump from this places them perfectly east or west of all of the brooms, and also perfectly between them horizontally. This is to set up the next Slippery Soap, so that we can drag Silky through all six of the remaining brooms and enchant them all with ice. This Slippery Soap will always target the healer, so have them go all the way to the other side of the brooms. Don't stop moving during the AoE cast and dodge the cross AoE afterwards. Once Silky finishes the cross AoE, the tank should drag them to the north side of the room and position them so that no brooms are directly south of you. Silky will use Bracing Suds and do a Soaping Spree, so you'll need to stand under Silky while also being safe from all of the Ice Brooms. This will get rid of every broom in the arena before the next mechanic. If you're playing well with good gear, there's a chance you kill Silky right about now, but keep in mind that the boss has more health in Criterion Savage, so if you intend on taking that on, I'd put some effort into learning this final pattern. Silky will use Dust Bluster and jump to the north middle of the room. Just use Knockback Resist again. After this, it will use Bracing Suds and Fresh Puff, summoning four Ice Brooms down the middle of the south side of the room. They will all tether to a player and move a fixed distance around the same time Silky finishes casting its next squeaky clean. The idea is to bait the brooms to the side away from the third wide sweep of squeaky clean. Otherwise, they will be enchanted with wind and there's going to be no safe spots. There are two ways to do this mechanic. First is to find the broom you are tethered to and get directly under it. Once you see what direction Squeaky Clean is going, aim the brooms directly to the east or west. This is super straightforward but requires decent accuracy on your broom aiming. It also forces you to run away from the boss and is quite susceptible to slightly bad angles. This can lead to AoEs cleaving through the boss's bracing suds or even worse, them tethering together and instantly wiping the group. Our group used a different strat. We all stacked immediately behind Silky and just waited to see which direction Squeaky Clean was going. Once we saw, we immediately moved over to the center of our other marker, and this baits all of the brooms forward and slightly offset, so none of them are changed to wind. This eliminates needing to find the right broom, running back to it, angling the movement, and it also always ensures the brooms will never tether. The downside is the reaction time is a bit tighter and one broom will hit smack dab on the marker with its movement, so as soon as the markers over your heads disappear, you have to move to avoid it. Once you're clear, stand directly north near the wall to avoid all of the AoEs. If you do get a wind broom or two, it's not over. Use a tank LB and some extra mitt and you should survive. Even with the damage down, you should be good to finish the fight. After this, there's just a few more attacks. Total Wash, two back-to-back -back Slippery Soaps, and finally Enrage. The total fight time is about five and a half minutes. Once you're ready, take the portal in the center of the boss room to the second trash room. 
You'll be up top of a platform and need to choose when to jump down, so take a moment here to actually analyze what the room has in it. Here we have four patrolling mobs, two Dullahans and two armors. Each of them is walking along a set path like you see in this image, so it's best to eliminate them in pairs, one Dullahan and one armor from each path. It's also best to fight them to the far east or far west sides of the room, as it ensures the only patrol that will walk that way is the other one that is part of that pair. The Dullahans have three skills. Infernal Pain is a hard-hitting AoE plus bleed on the party. Blighted Gloom is a large point-blank AoE, you'll want to get out of that. And King's Will is a massive damage buff. Be sure to mitigate Infernal Pain and the auto attacks after King's Will. The armors use Hell's Nebula, which reduces everyone to 1 HP. They shortly after use Infernal Weight, which does damage to everyone and slows their movement speed a lot. It also follows us up by turning to a player and casting Dominion Slash, a Conal AoE. Just ensure you, very slowly, walk away from the front side to avoid this. It's very important you do not pull an armor if you still have the bleed from the Dullahan, and you shouldn't be fighting two mobs at once ever when it comes to this pack. The bleed will most likely kill the entire party as soon as it ticks if you have both an armor and a Dullahan. Other than that, just try to take it slow and ensure you fight everything one at a time. If one of the patrols is creeping up on your spot, go Metal Gear Solid and sneak around to try to avoid aggro. Once all four mobs are dead, the door to the second boss will open. The second boss is the Gladiator of Sildi. Before pulling the boss, we just have four simple markers down as a quick reference for one mechanic. You don't need these, but they'll potentially help for the very first thing you need to do. They are placed on these little divots on the floor design like you see here, so just try your best to emulate this. At the start, pull the boss to the south side of the room for the first mechanic. Flash of Steel is the room-wide AoE, so just mitigate this every time you see it. Spectre of Might is the first mechanic. This will summon two specters on the northeast and northwest sides of the room. They will begin pulsing anywhere from one to three times before casting Rush of Might. This will cause them to dash to the tick marker on the lines that appeared during this mechanic. That tick marker will match the number of pulses that they actually did. When they reach the end point, they will do a half room AoE in one direction before turning around and doing one behind them. This ends up making more like a triangle sized safe spot, but fortunately the movement for this isn't very severe. So a few quick tricks for this. First, the pulses are actually color coordinated. The red pulse means that the specter will pulse again and the gold pulse means they are done pulsing, so you can identify the number of dashes well before the cast bar actually finishes. If one of them only pulses once, just count the number of pulses the other one does, then stand just behind the tick on that second specter's line towards the center of the room. As soon as the dash goes off, go directly through the AoE to the other side and you'll be safe. If both of the specters pulse at least twice, go to the marker closest to the specter that pulsed a third time. Same deal, once they pass through, go to the other side. This is the only reason we have these markers, but it helped us a lot. After the first set of specters, the boss will summon two more, though this time from the southwest and southeast. It's otherwise identical, so just swing the boss around to the other side of the room. After the second set of specters, the gladiator will use Sculptor's Passion. This is a split damage line AoE that also does more damage to the first target hit. Have your tank stand in front of everyone else with a cooldown up, while everyone else ensures to mitigate the hit as well. Next is Mighty Smite, just a tank buster, so treat this as you normally would. The next main mechanic is Curse of the Fallen. This will give a few debuffs out to different players. Every player will get a spread debuff, one player will get a stack debuff, and one player will also get a pulsing AoE debuff. The four spread AoEs will go off at the same time, while the split damage and pulsing AoE will go off at the same time as well. You'll need to identify which set of mechanics is going off first, and react accordingly. If the spread debuff, Echo of the Fallen, has 13 seconds on it, it'll be spreads first. If it's 17 seconds, it'll be the stack and pulsing AoE first. While you're resolving these debuffs, the Gladiator will jump middle and begin casting Ring of Might. This will perform a point-blank AoE followed by a donut AoE. The size of the point-blank and donut are determined by the number of pulses the boss does, same rules as the Spectres. So dodge the point blank while doing either the stack or spread, then move into the donut and do the other mechanic. If it's stack first, have the stack debuff player and the other two without the lingering echoes pulsing debuff all stand south, 
while the Lingering Echoes player goes north. Once the AoE goes off, move in and quickly spread. I'd recommend using body language while you're stacked up to indicate what direction you're going to move for the spread. If it's spread first, have the three players without Lingering Echoes spread closer to the south side of the room, so it's easier for them to stack up quickly when they run in for the donut. Lingering Echoes just go do everything somewhere else. We just don't want to be near you. The Lingering AoE will only pulse a few times, so be sure to move out of it as soon as it's dropped and stay out of it until it disappears. After another flash of steel will be Hateful Visage. This summons a ton of Visage heads in a cross pattern throughout the room. Every one of them will fire one line AoE in the direction of the orb in front of them. At the same time, several orbs will spawn around the outside of the room, doing a two-part grid AoE to dodge as well. Finally, every player will be marked and targeted by nothing beside remains from the boss. This just does a large earth AoE around every player. It sounds like a lot, but simply put, assign every player to a quadrant and just have them dodge everything. That's it. And also make sure not to overlap the earth AoEs. After this will be another Flash of Steel, so heal up and mitigate. Next is Accursed Visage. This will do the exact same attack as Hateful Visage, except now the players are marked with Golden and Silver Flame debuffs. These debuffs will kill a player if they are not dispelled before expiring. To dispel them, you need to be hit by one of the Visage AoEs of the opposite color. So Golden Flame needs to be dispelled by the Silver AoE and vice versa. One player will have two gold flames, one player will have two silver flames, and the remaining two players will have one of each. Each quadrant of the room will fulfill one of these conditions, so each player needs to find the correct quadrant to solve the mechanic and deliberately be hit by both Visage AoEs in that quadrant. Since there are two players that have one of each, these two need to be careful not to claim the same quadrant. It's not too hard to come up with a quick priority since there's only four people, but we just used our eyeballs. After this is another Flash of Steel before the boss cast Curse of the Monument. This will tether the DPS to each other and the tank and healer to each other. This tether must be broken or it's going to be a bad time. Every player will also be marked with a 1 or 2 debuff and a Scream of the Fallen debuff. The number marker just indicates whether you have a shorter or longer Scream debuff, so we can just use the numbers when we need them later. At the same time, the Gladiator summons rotating Sundered Remains AoEs that explode in the same order they appear. We had our melee and tank tank west priority, while our range and healer had east priority. Depending on the rotation of the AoEs, you'll want to adjust your running location to ensure both a clean tether break and AoE dodge. Even in my Savage Clear though, I did take a hit from one of these rotating AoEs, but the chain was broken, so we lived, so definitely prioritize the chain breaking. Once the AoEs are gone, two towers will appear on opposite sides of each other near the boss. You'll need the players marked with the two to take these, because the one marked player's scream debuffs are going to expire and do large AoEs around them. The twos take the first pair of towers, while the ones run to the wall on opposite sides of the room. Once the first towers go off, the one players take the second pair of towers, while the two players go to the wall for their explosions. For priority here, we used our chain breaking positions as priority, melee tank west and north, and range and healer east and south. If both players in the same pair have the same number, then you just need to decide on one person who's going to go far, basically fulfill the opposite priority, and you're going to have to do that for both the tank and melee group and for the ranged and healer group. Once the towers are done, you're done with all the mechanics. You'll do one more Flash of Steel, repeat the Spectres of Might, one more Sculptor's Passion, then another Flash of Steel, and then Enrage. Again, you have about five and a half minutes, though depending on how much the boss has to jump back to the middle, you may get a few extra seconds. With that, go through the portal, and you'll be taken to the final boss. The final boss is Shadowcast Zealous Ga. Our letter markers were largely for orientation and some light callouts, while our number markers were crucial for a strategy we use later. I'll discuss that when we get to it. On pull, the boss will use Show of Strength, a roomwide AoE to mitigate and heal. The first real mechanic is Infern Brand. This summons four fire orbs each tethered to a staff. This summons four fire orbs each tethered to a staff. The orb will spawn a rotating AoE, moving the staff 90 degrees in that direction at the end of the animation. The orb will then teleport to the staff's new location and explode. So you need to predict the movement of the orbs with the rotating AoE and get to a safe spot in advance. At the same time, the boss will begin casting Fire Steel Strike. This will jump to two random players and do a massive AoE around them. While this inflicts magic vulnerability to the primary player hit, 
It will send any other players nearby hurtling into the wall, certainly killing them. So you need to identify the safe spots from the brands while also spreading just enough to not kill each other with the strike. There are a lot of patterns you could memorize, but instead I have a few quick tricks to identify safe spots in a snap. First, assign tank and melee to the north side of the room and your ranged and healer to the south side. You just want to focus on avoiding your partner and understanding how you two are going to use the space between each other, depending on the pattern. You'll also only need to focus entirely on the brands on your side of the room. I oriented myself facing the nearest wall of the arena to help determine my spot. If both rotations are clockwise, with one of them being to the left, the corner of the room to the right is wide open. Just have both players stand on opposite corners like you see us doing here. If both rotations are counterclockwise and one is on the right, then the corner of the room to the left is wide open, with the same safe positioning. If they are both rotating into each other, go to the side where they are rotating into and it's the same safe spots. I got cheeky and stood between them like this, but you really only need the same safe spots as the first two examples. Now if the clockwise or counterclockwise patterns are opposite to the ones I showed you first, then the safe spot's actually closer to the middle of the room. It'll be on the same side as the left or right rotating symbol, right for clockwise and left for counterclockwise. One player can stand in a spot similar to the other pattern. However, the other player needs a spot closer to the center of the room. It's basically right between the second and third arena squares. The reason you use this instead of going a little further, as you see you have some space here, is because there are combinations where all four players can end up sharing one giant open safe spot. This spot ensures that there is more than enough space for all four players in this particular pattern. It's a hell of a mechanic to describe, but once you get used to it, you can just see your safe spot with a quick glance of your two rotating symbols and get there no sweat, so just practice it. Right after both fire steel strikes hit, the boss will begin casting Blessed Beacon. This will fire a line AoE at the two players the boss jumped on one at a time, killing them because they have a magic bolt. To prevent that player from dying, another player without a magic bolt needs to stand between the target and the boss. This will greatly reduce the damage so that everyone can survive. We had two priorities for this. If one player to the north and one player to the south were jumped on, then the other north or south player would block for their friend, so I as a melee would block for the tank and vice versa. If two players on the same side get jumped on, we did it role based, so the healer or tank would block for the other and the DPS for the DPS. I definitely recommend saving gap closers for this movement because the boss can get really far away. Healers especially might struggle to close the cap if you're not a sage, so be wary of your partner's position and take extra steps away from the boss to ensure a proper block if need be. Also, the AoE is quite wide, so ensure the Vold players are a decent amount away from each other and the blockers aren't super deep in the hitbox. Right after this is Fire Steel Fracture. It's a giant conal AoE tank buster, so start dragging the boss towards the middle and face it away and mitigate. Next is Infern Brand 2. This will summon two sets of four tripwires, each marked from one to four. Each player will also be marked with a number between one and four. The number of your debuff determines which tripwires you are able to safely disarm. However, the tripwires must be disarmed in numerical order from one to four. Otherwise, the player will be trapped, boned, stunned, and eventually blow up on the raid. At the same time, there will be either a set of three horizontal squares or two vertical squares, which will eventually expand and blast the entire row or column they are aiming at. We'll use these to determine which of the sets of tripwires we're breaking first. If the horizontal AoEs appear first, break the horizontal wires first, and vice versa for the vertical wires. For starting positions, you'll want one to be either northeast or southwest. One of these two spots will always have two one-marked wires intersecting, which ensures you can eventually break every wire. Two needs to keep an eye out. They will either be on the same side as one or across, depending on where the two marked wires intersect. Three will always be on the opposite side of the room from one, and four can actually just be wherever, so long as they break their wire when the time comes. It's better to be on the side closest to wherever you can break it so the movement is quick though. So break the first set of wires and dodge the line AoEs from the squares. The boss will use cast shadow as these AoEs are going off doing two sets of conal AoEs from the center of the room. 
dodge these, dodge the lasers, and as soon as one no longer has a magic bone, they should start the second tripwire sequence. When you do your first tripwire, you'll get about a 10 second magic bone, so that's about the time window you're looking for. Break the entire second set and then dodge the second set of line AoEs. There will be a fire steel fracture that starts casting around the time the squares explode, and so be sure the tank aims this away from the party. Show of Strength will cast again, and then we're on to Infern Brand number 3. This will summon 4 stabs along the middle of the arena, as well as several laser brands. When activated, these laser brands will prevent movement between the safe rows. The stabs, on the other hand, will eventually fire out 2 conal AoEs on the 2 nearest players, going off 2 stabs at a time. It will either be 2 inner stabs or 2 outer stabs blowing up first, followed by the other. The big part of this mechanic are the portals. Every player will be marked with a portal and a rotating symbol. When the debuff Rite of Passage expires after 20 seconds, your portal will rotate and then teleport you to wherever it ends up. There will also be four portals around the outside of the room, two north and two south. These will accomplish something similar, teleporting you between two end locations. One of these two portals on each side will actually send you into the wall, so you'll need to pay attention to which one is rotating where, and determine which one is safe to use. Both sides of the portals are active for these ones as well, so you can teleport from the middle to the outside of the arena, or from the outside in. You'll also get a debuff called Call of the Portal. If this debuff expires, you instantly die, but it gets dispelled by taking one of the four portals that spawns around the arena. So the mechanic goes like this. Players take the first portal, bait the first staff. Their teleport rotates and activates, they bait the second staff, mechanic is over. There are two easy ways to resolve this. The first requires identifying which set of staffs is exploding first, inner or outer. Then players need to solve where their portal will send them for the second teleport location. You'll do the first teleport, bait the first staff, then teleport in right next to the second staff and bait that one. When it's all done right, it looks like this. We eventually moved to a different way of doing it that eliminated some of that thinking. We just sent the players with east-facing portals initially north, and west-facing portals south. The clockwise players get teleported to the outside first, and the counterclockwise players get teleported inside first. Then we used our number markers as true spots for all of the baits. Regardless of which stabs were first, this ensures clean baits from everyone with semi-fixed positions. The downside is that the movement is a good bit tighter, especially if your first teleport sends you to the opposite side of the room as your marker. As such, sprint or gap closers help a ton. I also like to jump as the first bait is going off to cover some of that distance to my other bait spot, like you see me doing here. If it's the inner stabs too, the movement can be made a lot more forgiving if the far north or south players move as close as they can within their own section. Really helps trim down the risk, especially in the case of a long run. Either way, it just takes a bit of understanding of the rotating AoEs and how they operate, so pick a strategy that works best for you. Once that resolves, there's another Firesteel Fracture before Infern Brand 4. This summons three of those squares from Brand number 2. They're going to expand and blow up an entire row or column just as they did before. This time, they are attached to stabs that will rotate after a short delay. The square then teleports to the stab's final location and fires. There's also going to be two more Firesteel Strikes and two Blessed Beacons, much like Brand number 1 so you'll need to find the safe spots from the lasers and be spread enough to not send each other into the wall. Fortunately, there's a couple of easy ways to identify where it's safe. First, let's start with the columns. There will always be a portal in the middle of the room. If the staff attached to it is east or west, then the middle column isn't safe, no matter the rotation. 
if the staff is north or south, you'll need to read the rotation and figure out whether it's rotating east or west. This leaves the middle column and the opposite side column safe. For the rows, their portals will always face directly towards the middle. So it's just a matter of reading whether or not they are rotating towards you or away from you. If the arrows are ever rotating into you within one row of the arena, then you are not safe. If you're more than one row away or the nearest square is rotating away from you, then you're a-okay. There's a couple of quick identifications you can do based on whether they're both clockwise or both counterclockwise or opposite. You don't have to memorize all that, just if they're rotating into you, you're not safe. There will always be four squares not hit by lasers, so you can assign relative safe squares. You can have one player on the back left safe, one player back right safe, one player front left safe, and one player front right safe. However, you can also safely fit two people in one square if you're just on opposite corners, much like during brand number one. So if you and someone else end up in the same square, just be on opposite sides of it, similar to what you see us doing here. After the strikes and blessed beacon is another show of strength before the final mechanic. On normal mode, you might even skip this section if your fight has been clean with decent DPS, but for Savage, you'll definitely need to know it. Infern Brand 5 is another tripwire mechanic, though with much tighter movements. There will be four stabs, each doing the two baited AoEs from brand number three. The stabs will go off one at a time for two baits each, so you have two players that will need to disarm the tripwires while the other two do the baits. Just watch your magic volns during this entire sequence. Don't try to disarm a tripwire while you still have a magic voln from the staff baits. One and two marked players should start in the very center of the room, while three and four find the first staff that is detonating and prepare their bait. As soon as the tripwire debuff activates, have one and two quickly disarm the tripwire between them and the three and four players. After three and four bait, the three and four players run across and disarm the same color tripwires so one and two can do the second staff bait. At the same time as the one two bait resolves, the boss will use pure fire to drop baited AoEs under every player. To help with space, the three and four player can move back to where they did their first staff bait and drop their AoEs there, and then just everyone can move towards the center of the room. Once the magic vuln from the baits wears off, have one and two disarm the second set of tripwires so three and four can go bait. One and two should hang middle to avoid being clipped here as well. Finally, the boss will use cast shadow with the two alternating conal patterns. As soon as three and four have their magic vuln wear off, they should disarm their tripwires. Do not wait until cast shadow is all the way completed to do this, as it leaves you with very little time for one and two to get into position for the final bait. Once the tripwires are done and one and two bait, you are done with the final mechanic. All that's left here is Fire Steel Fracture, a normal show of strength, and then a final long cast show of strength for the Enrage. In total, it's just about 5 minutes and 45 seconds for the entire fight, a couple of seconds less. With that, you've cleared another Sildeen Subterrain. You'll obtain 4 silver from the final chest, which can be spent on a number of items back in Old Charlian from Tresassant, if that's how you call that guy's name. These items can also drop from the chest at the end if you're lucky enough. For those wondering about Savage, I can do a brief description here. In Savage, you must have a full pre-made before you queue in. All monster health and damage is increased, especially from the trash, which will outright one-shot anyone they hit with any of their skills. Most of the trash AoE markers are also removed, so you'll need to remember the names and ranges of the most dangerous attacks. If a player dies, there are no means of resurrecting them in Savage, not even the variant rays. They will have to remain on the ground until the rest of the party joins them. Upon the party being wiped out, the dungeon will be completely reset, so you'll have to start from the first trash pull all over again. Finally, while every boss still has their hard enrage, the dungeon itself has a 24 minute enrage that starts from the moment you pull the first trash mob. So yes, you must clear the entire dungeon without dying from the first trash pull to the final boss in under 24 minutes. Otherwise, every remaining enemy inside receives the Sewer Dweller buff, making them nigh unkillable and making all of their attacks lethal. This includes things like countdown timers and pre-pull setup running between enemies, so be sure to plan out when you use your buffs on trash or even on the bosses near the end of their fights. I hold twos at the end of both the first and the second boss to help with the trash pull that's in the corridors and to help with the burst on the final boss. The reward instead for clearing this is a single manuscript. 
which can be used to buy a housing banner or a pair of glam earrings. Or materia if you really want to. The achievement also gives a title, but this is mostly a piece of content for bragging rights and not for the rewards, in case that wasn't evident. It's also a great consistency check for players looking to improve this aspect of their play. With that, I'm finally done with this guide! Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and stay tuned for my other guides on all the contents, and I hope you appreciate the lengths I went to for this one. I will see you all in the next guide, and until then, take care.